Hello to my earth signs. Now don't go anywhere. Uh, I'm going to take us on a little journey with some group astrology first, if I may. Um, and then you can skip to your rising signs in the comments section below. Hit the timestamp. But this moon is seems to be packing a bit of a punch. And as I've sort of been, you know, putting my nose to the grindstone and sat down in my office and getting them all out, there's been some real emotional intensity that sort of started to surface. And I want to maybe highlight perhaps the reason why that might be as a group. So the Sagittarius full moon is happening at 13 degrees in opposition with the sun in Gemini at 13 degrees. And for the most part, the other planets and configurations and aspects are fairly in the clear-ish. There's nothing quite sort of dire happening, save for this one exact trine with the asteroid Pallas Athena in Leo. So there's a communication between Leo and Sagittarius at the exact moment of this moon. And I felt that I really need to talk about it because I, I had a lovely reading last week with someone called Kirstine. She lives in Scotland. And in the aftermath of that reading, she posted this beautiful drawing of Medusa that she had made. And we were speaking about Pallas Athena and the significations in Kirstine's chart and, and how um, pivotal that energy may be for her experience here. And so in response to that, she drew this beautiful drawing of Medusa and included a section of poem by an artist called Nikita Gill, who has written a book called Great Goddesses, which is feminist reimaginings of ancient mythology. And I want to read it to you. And this is kind of the stanza that's colouring all of these readings. I'll make you a trade. Your beauty for stone your sea-beloved tresses for venom-filled snakes, your innocent doe eyes for frigid gaze. The sea is in the habit of ravishing what does not belong to him, taking without consideration. But, sweet girl, I promise you, I will not allow this to be your ruin. You're sacred, one of my own. And no cruel chaos will devour you again. Choose terror over maiden, relinquish your human and I will turn you into a goddess in your own right, a deity of monsters, a myth that will scare men for all the years and their seasons. It's pretty powerful, and it's such a story of protection or the attempt to protect. In the traditional mythology, Athena was the one that turned Medusa into the monster because Poseidon against Medusa's will, I might add, had taken her. And so when we think about the idea of this story, generations of handing down all by the hand of man rather than, than woman, it can, you can see how that kind of story of sort of smite and jealousy gets sewn into our subconscious and how beautiful it is that at this moment in time we get to take control over the story. If this is third house stuff, if this is our village, stories that are shared by voice rather than the written word, then we get to change the myth, the intent and this is what Nikita Gill's done so beautifully in her writing. She's not changed the uh, narrative of the myth, but the intent of the characters has a whole new fresh perspective. Language evolves. And this beautiful story between sisters and one of them longing and trying to protect her gives the mythology of Medusa so much powerful resonance. Now, I'm wearing my old leather jacket that I haven't worn for about three years. But in regard to a mantle of protection, a mantle of the monster, this was mine. I was a showgirl and I used to perform all the time. And I used to chuck this thing on to get to the gig and back again. 
It was protecting me because no one would fuck with me when I was wearing this. It still smells like hairspray. I also made this little lino cut when I was 14. I was obsessed with mythology, the goddesses in particularly. And it's taken me until now to find this connector point, to find this relationship with my own story, but also to look out and really recognize how it connects a lot of us. Sometimes we behave in ways that are trying to protect. We're trying to protect ourselves or one another. And that sort of calcification of armor is there because it's protecting something really vulnerable and soft in the middle. But we can sometimes lose ourselves. For me anyway, I lost myself in the persona. This jacket was not my armor of bravery any longer. It was my cave that I would disappear into. So at this full moon, the mythology of Athena is talking to us. So it may color our readings moving forward. So if that's not really what you're into, you don't have to watch this one. I am going to be holding a ritual for this Sagittarius full moon this Sunday, the day of. So Sunday the 4th, if you're in the Southern Hemisphere with me, if you'd like to join, you can head to umaruby.com and book yourself a place at the ritual. It costs 50 bucks, but there is a discount code called the Six of Pentacles, which is valid for all of my work. If you want a reading from me, no matter what it is, your money, money's tight, put the Six of Pentacles in and it'll knock 25% off. No questions asked. So yeah, um, join me in your readings, won't you? Much love. Hello Capricorn, welcome to your horoscope for the Sagittarius full moon happening on Sunday the 4th of June at 1.43pm if you're in the Southern Hemisphere with me. So, bold, bright, full moon, no eclipse, quite a lot to let go of I would imagine. There's been a lot that we've all been holding on to and in this time and place, in this current period in history, we continue to hold on to it. We continue to harden our back to it and to rebuff and rebuff and repel. We protect ourselves and no matter which way we, we, we can, we're trying to get through. We're trying to disallow any kind of um, sensitivity or, or uh, retaliation to some of the bullshit that's going on right now. That takes its toll. And the tarot is really speaking to that. If the moon is at 13 degrees of Sagittarius, it's the nine of wands that we talk to at that decan. This person is exhausted and they're really wondering if they've got the steam, if they've got the stuff to keep going. Their head is bandaged and they're still standing watch. But I tell you what, they're still on their two feet. They haven't given up yet. And that's the major thing about this card, that we're reminded that we have the stuff to keep going. So, when we look at a Capricorn rising birth chart, Sagittarius rules the 12th house. And this has sticky definitions. It's where we have access to dreams and the unconscious collectively, but on a much more sincere, kind of difficult angle, the 12th house can relate to things that we hide, things that we keep quiet or keep secret. And in some generations, the 12th house was related to incarceration because of the impulses of the lunatic, those that were moved by the moon, the folks that had a tricky relationship with their mental health, and perhaps folks that had a different way of doing things. In Hellenistic astrology, it's called the house of bad spirit. Now that's sort of quite sinister, if you ask me. It's maybe not something that um, I intend to go too far into as far as, uh, uh, yeah, as far as evil. It's not interesting to me. 
I don't know about evil. I witness evil behavior, but I believe that there is no one that is inherently evil at their core. And so the twelfth house is something that is in us. So for that purpose, I don't think that it's evil. But to have a full moon here might have you feeling a, quite shaky, quite vulnerable. Our internal mechanisms have a way of sort of keeping the ball up in the air, don't they? Keeping those plates spinning, keeping us going. Sort of like, oh, slight, oh, slight, oh, oh, yeah, oh, going to keep going, keep going. For Capricorns, there is <clears throat> that insistence on marching forward, going up the hill, continuing, continuing, continuing. Don't show weakness. And I think that at this moon, it might be a really nice time for you to like have a tea break, have a moment. If we think about that story about Athena that I was telling you, you know, is that sort of, there is the, again that feeling of like, I did the best I could. I'm doing the best I can. I'm trying to protect you. I was trying to protect you. You've got something in common with Athena Capricorn. Athena was born from the head of Zeus, you know, no childhood, no um, maternal sort of uh, rearing or innocence, you know, like no need for a childhood. They were born fully in armour, ready to go. You've got to think about that for a moment. But you have the right to be vulnerable. You're allowed to be unsteady at times. It's in those times that I hope that you can look across the way and receive some nurturing and some comfort and some, some guidance and care. There can be a rigidity to Capricorn that feels quite brittle after a while. It can feel like it's about to snap. I know, I am one. I'm a Capricorn sun. <laughs> so if this full moon in your 12th house, the house of bad spirit, the house of internal workings, the house that we keep to ourselves and perhaps don't tell other people about. If this is the moon, then Pallas Athena is over in your eighth house of grief. Pallas Athena is standing in your eighth house of grief at this moon, Capricorn. Strong, strong back, open heart. Good thighs, can take it. So what are you grieving, Capricorn? And maybe at this moon you're allowed to name it. You're a really good person and you've been through the ringer. And Pluto's about to enter your sign again for another stay. So all of this destabilization of pre-existing structures, all of this, this shakes, this rock to the core, I thought I was this, I thought that's what I do, this, I, this is what I had. It's scary for someone that's so convinced, that's so on course, that's so hard working. That amount of destabilization can be really, really scary. But I think this Sagittarius full moon is a great one to be vulnerable. It's a great one to, as I said, stop. Pitch a tent if you have to on the mountaintop. You know? The recesses of the 12th can be beautiful. We can read the patterns, you know? The synchronicities. We can make the most of it in the 12th. Some things you do behind the proverbial closed door. Some things you do with the curtains drawn. If that person is really different to the person that you're projecting, that's a really interesting relationship. I had a breakdown 
full without doubt. Mental breakdown. In 2020, I lost my grip on everything that I thought that I knew, everything that I thought that I was here for. I chalked up my sorrows and losses and I felt that I'd made some big mistakes. And then I couldn't feel after a time. I actually physically couldn't feel. Scared the shit out of me. My 12th house supported me through that. I could do that behind the scenes. I could do that without fear. Well, that's not true. It, there was nothing but fear. But I could do that with the intention. No, there was no intention. <laughs> I don't know how I got through it. But it had a lot to do with taking this jacket off. It had a lot to do with setting down my persona, my armoured tank. In that moment, I could say to Athena, thank you, I understand what you're doing. I understand you are trying to help me. But I'm better when I'm soft. I'm better when I'm gentle and kind and loving and feminine. I'm better when I'm a pussy, a pansy, a faggot. All of that stuff that's said to you over time, you know, banks up and banks up. And our resilience can sometimes become so rigid. So if it comes to a point where you can't feel, that's when you look to a full moon. You can look to that full moon, you can work with that full moon, you can think about what you know of Sagittarius, if anything. Sagittarius wants to grow. Sagittarius longs to seek and to share. So maybe you can find yourself in there too, in some way. How am I related to the ideas of Sagittarius? I'm going to get you some tarot, Capricorn. Gee, these cards are slippery. <sighs> it's been a whack day. And I don't know if I have to start again tomorrow, but I will review these. I don't often. I just cut them and print them. Knight of Swords. The Hanged One. Wow. So we got the Hanged One upside down in the center of this reading Capricorn. So that's number 12 in the major secrets of the tarot. That's the 12th house. It's upside down. So if we think about the hanged one in terms of relinquishing control in order to receive spiritual guidance or enlightenment, if that's what you want to say, upside down, there's a struggle. Upside down, there's a fight against losing control. And there's a real worry that we're losing it. The Knight of Swords in reverse is a liar. There's something really untruthful here. There's something that is deceitful. And this could be the way that you're relating to yourself in your private time. Could be, you know, public facing, all good to go. Privately, you're losing it. This could be that. It could be also 
some example of behavior that you've been witness to or on the receiving end of. The last card I got is the Ten of Swords. It's over Capricorn. This is the end of a really difficult cycle. The swords represent our mentality, our thoughts, the way that our mind processes and works. The ten is an ending. The sun rises behind the figure in the ten of swords. I'm really sorry that things have been difficult for you. I really am. And I'm really proud of you for going the distance. And I'm really proud of you for being vulnerable in your 12th house. Because that's where you're going. In the 12th, we get to let it all hang out. Kick and scream. You'll come back to centre. I trust it. But what you've had to put up with in this life has been really, really difficult. And the slings and arrows and all the shit that's been said, those traumas bank up. And in this culture, we're only now developing the language to even name that or witness that in other. But we still don't have the exact strategies and solutions to unpick and unpack. I really encourage you to engage in therapy if you can. I know that it's a trial to get in the system. It really is. But if things are at this critical point for you where you can't find the way out, a good therapist will have the professional skills to work through this with you. The 12th house is part of us and it's something that is important to us too. Bad spirit, mm, don't know about that. That's another example that language can evolve in the same way that Nikita Gill rewrote the story of Medusa. We can further investigate the significations of the 12th house. It's important to know our history, know the moving parts, know where we came from. It's also important to read the room and to move forward and to evolve and to develop and to be who we are, this revolution or rebirth of identity has been remarkable and it's been such hard work that I hope that you can afford yourself a little tiny bit of rest at this full moon in Sagittarius and have a breather, if nothing else, just take a breather. That's your reading, Capricorn. Oceans of love to you. If you wanted to join me in ritual, you can head to umaruby.com and book yourself in a spot there. Um, if you're still here with me, drop me a snake in the comments, won't you? Um, you don't have to say anything, um, but just a snake would be fine. I'm um, attempting to win the algorithm on YouTube to get some more eyes on the work. <laughs> um, Take care. If you want me to read your birth chart, always welcome. Come to Uma Ruby. Throw six of pentacles in the, dis in the coupon code if money's an issue for you at the moment. There's no questions asked. That's a discount that's available for all time. Take it easy and I'll speak to you in two weeks for the new moon in Gemini. Hello Taurus Rising, welcome to your horoscope for the Sagittarius full moon on Sunday the 4th of June at 1.43pm if you're in the Southern Hemisphere with me. So all of that stuff that I was talking about, about the moon and about Athena and about our ability to rewrite mythology, to really consider it and to recognise the ancient message and how it was transcribed through time by the hand of man rather than woman and how now in this moment we get to have beautiful writers like Nikita Gill translate the myth again in a language that has resonance for our experience 
and for our generation. It's really nice. This moon in Sagittarius is lighting up your eighth house, Taurus. The eighth is a tough nut to crack. The eighth is where we grieve. It's where we find that our resources are interwoven with that of somebody else's. And I might say that it's got a lot to do with ancestry, that it has a lot to do with the lesson that we all need to learn, which is how to say goodbye. So that's a pretty heavy moon. Pallas Athena is in your fourth house of home, roots, stability, privacy. So I like the encouragement from Athena for you at this time, Taurus. It kind of feels like Athena has the wheel. You know, Athena in her act of protection, trying to protect her sister in, the, in, the, in, the, in a way that she knew how. There's something about, I did the best that I could with what I had, is a real message that's coming through this reading. And hopefully that can be something that you can hang on to, Taurus. You can hold that sentiment, that sentence. And that can be something that you can work with at this full moon in Sagittarius in the eighth house. I did the best that I could with what I had. That's a really freeing thing to say and to reconcile in your own relationship with yourself, your own decisions. <clears throat> that got you from there to there to there to here. It's also a really powerful, freeing thing to hear from a caregiver. I did the best I could with what I had. We can forgive in the eighth house too. There's room for that. I hope that there's a lot of room for that great deal of forgiveness for those that were in charge of nurturing us and a great deal of forgiveness for ourselves as the responsible nurturer. I think Pallas Athena, with her leathery mantle of protection, is being kind of like quite forthright at this one. Now remember, she's in Leo. You know, that's, that's a lot of pride, a lot of power, a lot of strength. The card for Leo is the strength card. And I'm just looking at it here as I'm giving this reading. And so in this version of the story, might is achieved with kindness and gentility. The strength of this person here in this card is mighty, but not because of a domineering force or violence or brutishness. It's quite the opposite. It's to do with compassion and understanding and tenderness and sweetness. The lines that travel through our fourth house can be really confusing. <laughs> they can be really painful too. But if we, if we are met with the statement, I did the best I could with what I had, we can take that information and we can empathize with the person that's saying it. And we can offer them our forgiveness. It's in our power to do so. And it may not come straight away. Maybe now is not the time. 
But at this full moon in the eighth house in Sagittarius, it's definitely the time to make progress on that idea. These readings have been really hard and I wasn't expecting it for a full moon in Sagittarius. I was expecting some, you know, some buoyant uh, centaur action. But then, yeah, I'm kind of reminded of the other centaur in astrology, which is Chiron, you know. The wounded traveller, the wounded healer. We all carry a lot of wounds. And in a time when we've had to put on our monster mantle, you know, I can tell, tell you this jacket, you know, I haven't worn it in three years. It changes the way I walk. It changes the way I talk. Just by putting it on, I remember that gate, that frame of protection. I used to say things like, oh, don't worry, I'm just a man. Fuck it, who cares? I'll protect you. All that sort of weird stuff. I used to say it to myself. Sometimes I'd say it to friends of mine. I used to say it to myself quite often. I was protecting the gentle one within. I named this when I was 14 at a time when I needed the goddess most. I needed Athena when I was 14. Turns out I had her, I found her. Isn't that something? We did the best that we could with what we had. And so if we can open our hearts up to other people, we can open our hearts up to ourselves too. We can work on some of that tough terrain in the fourth house. As a Taurus individual, I'm sure that you're building a beautiful fourth house of your own some way, somehow. I'm sure that your ability to create nesting space of comfort and pleasure and privacy is really perfect. And I'm glad that you're doing that and I hope that you can enjoy some of that sanctuary too. When Athena's asking you to look back and to hear what's being said, there are some relationships that will never hear that. We might not hear it from the mouth of the person involved, but somewhere on the track, somewhere down the line, somewhere in the eighth house, we hear it. And we get to say, I forgive you. It's really, really cool. I'm going to get you some tarot cards, I reckon, Taurus. How's Jupiter in the first house for you? Is it good? Another 12 months of this to look forward to. Funny thing is, Athena was born out of the head of Jupiter. <laughs> Jupiter is another name for Zeus. And so that was where kind of Athena was working from. Athena had no childhood. Athena was born ready in full armour, full leather jacket, ready to fight, ready to protect, ready to do what she conceived was right. And so in that way, Athena too did the best that she could with what she had. Jupiter wants to zoom in on that. Jupiter in your first house is settling in 
for a longer stay. So I hope that there's some, I hope there's some juiciness for you in there, Taurus. I hope there's some self-celebration in your beautiful self-made fourth house. <laughs> Ten of Swords, Queen of Pentacles in reverse, Six of Swords in reverse. We're at the end of a very difficult cycle, you and I. Those eclipses that were playing out in your seventh house and your first house, I'm sure, would have been really tricky. And there may have been relationships that don't exist anymore. And there may have been a new perception of yourself that was just fighting, clawing its way out. And so now you might be feeling a little bit raw and you might be feeling that you actually maybe are a bit unprepared for what's to come next. And this is why perhaps some of this imagery of the fourth might be coming back to you, of your own experience of upbringing, your own experience of childhood or not. Maybe you're a bit like Athena, born ready. But at this time, after the turbulence of the eclipses, you're feeling a bit unsure of yourself. I think that you're gonna be just fine. And it feels to me from these tarot cards that you kind of almost don't need to go anywhere to seek out that comfort. That where you are right now, as it lands, play the dice as they land, is what they say, you know? That you're doing the best that you can with what you have. And it's pretty remarkable it's pretty beautiful when you think about it. Do you have memories of yourself when you were a kid? And do you have memories of what you thought you might be like at the age that you are now? <laughs> it's funny sitting here with my 14 year old self and my Medusa on. <laughs> Makes me feel nice to find that connector point. Hopefully somewhere in there, Taurus, your younger version is giving you a bit of a pep talk too, maybe is looking around your place, your fourth house going, wow, this place is so cool. Can I stay the night? You're gonna let them. You're gonna eat popcorn, watch your favorite movies and have ice cream for dinner. <laughs> that's your reading Taurus take it easy I know I will <laughs> um, I am holding ritual on this full moon so if you prefer not to be alone then pop onto zoom um, you can book a ticket via umaruby.com uh, the discount code six of pentacles works for all of my work so if you want your birth chart read whatever but uh, I think there's $50 on the ticket price for this ritual, but it'll knock 25% off, so it's like 30 or something. Um, yeah, I'd love to have you there. Um, also, if you're still here with me, drop me a snake in the comments. I'm trying to get the algorithm pleased with me. So more eyes on the work for me means more energy to create the work in the first place. I uh, love you very much, Taurus. Thank you for all your support and thank you for being here with me. Take care. Bye. Hello, Virgo rising. Welcome to your horoscope for the Sagittarius full moon happening on Sunday, the 4th of June at 1.43 p.m. if you're in the Southern Hemisphere with me. Um, just to let you know, the moon's in Virgo right now as I'm recording these, which I just think is quite nice. So hopefully I'll be... Um, picking up what you're putting down and that this will be a nice reading for you and just for you. So Sagittarius rules your fourth house, Virgo. 
This is our home, our privacy, and our access to a root system. It can be like the physical space that we call home. It can have a lot to do with our bloodlines and our family lineage, that sort of thing. So a full moon in Sagittarius is the moment to weigh it up, to get what's on your chest off it, what's on your mind off it, and to celebrate your successes in that area and to give yourself a bit of a break at the other parts that are in process. Now, Pallas Athena, the asteroid that I was describing to you in the intro, is in your 12th house in a time when we're all really working hard, doing all we can to keep it running, keep it afloat. Um, and when we're in the mix of a whole bunch of language that feels really regressive, that feels like it's from the past, uh, that's triggering and so maybe there's things that are sort of being brought up for you at this time that you're sort of like, oh, no, I thought we were past that or I thought we moved through that or I actually don't have the mental capacity to deal with that right now. Um, yeah, the 12th house is the house of... In Hellenistic astrology, it was called the house of bad spirit. And so if we think about things that are hidden or that things that aren't public, that is not so accessible to not just the public-facing world, but perhaps to people in our lives and perhaps to ourselves sometimes as well. The 12th is definitely holds potential. There's room to swim around in the 12th. There's room to journey. There's also a lot of trickier parts that sometimes rear their head up to say hello. But Pallas Athena is there and this imagery of like the monster, the mantle of the monster, you know. I said it to Taurus, but I don't know if you've heard the phrase, I did the best with what I had at the time. It's pretty powerful to receive that. It's pretty powerful to allow yourself to say that too. If we're thinking about the 12th as maybe having something to do with regret or something to do with missed opportunities or an internal struggle, an internal battle with oneself and one's uh, lot in life or one's choices, if you can say to yourself, I did the best that I could with what I had, you know, it's what Pallas Athena is saying, right? In this new version of the text, Nikita Gill is telling us, just rewriting the script for us. Athena was trying to protect Medusa from further invasion, to use her as an emblem to strike fear in the minds of those that would dare try that sort of shit ever again. In hindsight, Athena is probably thinking, didn't have to get rid of all your beautiful hair. <laughs> didn't have to teach you to be a monster in order to save yourself. Also didn't work because your head was cut off. You'll notice that Athena has Medusa's face on her breastplate sometimes. You can see that image in some of the ancient paintings and drawings and stuff like that. In this new interpretation, this is an honour to her sister. This is like I was doing the best that I could. So how can you relate that sort of sentiment of maybe regret? But devotion, how can you relate that to your 12th house of self-undoing, privacy, behind-the-scenes work, and your fourth house of your home, your roots, your stability, and your bloodline? Who's speaking to you right now, Virgo? Who's saying to you, I did the best that I could with what I had at the time? And hey, look at you now. 
I'm really proud of you. What a beautiful fourth house that you've created off your own steam, off your own back. This is incredible. <laughs> Some people retaliate to experiences in life by guarding up, gearing up. It's this jacket. I'm never going to throw this thing out. I was going to. I haven't worn it for three years. But this jacket is an emblem of my mantle of the monster. It became a cage for me after a while. I put it on to protect myself. Leaving the venue to get home, walking down the street, whatever it was, you know, it's sort of like, don't even try it, mate. Don't even try it. I was safe in this jacket. I was also calcified. The gentle, vulnerable, soft, feminine parts of me took second fiddle to this beast that was sort of emerging. It still smells like the beast. It's a mixture of hairspray and cigarettes and beer. <laughs> but I was doing the best that I could with what I had. I was doing the best that I could to work through fear. I was doing the best that I could to work through triggers, threats of violence. This life is long, Virgo. And we get to look forward to a really, really long time here. We also get to put our heads over our shoulders every now and again and with a bit of regard, see what brought us to this point and who brought us here. Maybe there were some decisions that were the wrong ones or maybe there was behaviour that was pretty intense or retaliation. Maybe you were treated poorly by folks in your fourth house, folks that should have been taking care of you. If you can hear them and if they're saying to you, I did the best that I could with what I had, Shit. How freeing to accept that. How freeing to accept that beautiful, beautiful offer. And how gorgeous to provide your forgiveness. Now, this isn't to discount bad behavior and you probably might not hear it from everyone that you really want to hear it from. Not in this lifetime anyway, but that's what the 12th house is for. Perhaps that message is coming through the 12th house at this, this full moon to provide you with a bit of relaxation around your own fourth house, the one that you're building, the one that you're in charge of, the one that you're providing for others perhaps the folks that are in your care or that will be in your care and if you can do the best that you can with what you have for those young ones then you actually can't do more than that it's a lot of kimmies in this life which uh, are never satisfied that they weren't prom queen. They're pissed off that they didn't get what all the other girls got or whatever, you know, that, that's separate. It's not what we're talking about. There's a real humble feeling that I'm getting at this full moon. <sighs> Which is tantamount to perhaps some of the significations of Sagittarius, who is really bold and expressive. But also Sagittarius really wants to learn. Sagittarius has their eyes and ears and mind wide open to absorb. So this is a nice lesson to absorb, to witness someone in humble energy, to witness yourself and be cute about it and kind. Say, so you know what, darling, like, I get it. I know why. 
This jacket stinks. <laughs> I take it off. I'm going to get you some tarot cards, Virgo. <sighs> Eight of Pentacles. That's you. Hard worker. Nose to the grindstone. Don't drop the chop. Keep going. Repetition. Don't worry. I've got it. I've got it. I'm handling it. It's being handled. <laughs> Two of swords. Two of cups. Yeah. Intentional stillness at this full moon for you, Virgo. All of the things on the to-do list, all of the things that you need to um, get organized can relax at this full moon, just even if it's for half an hour. But I want to encourage you to set down your responsibilities, set down the to-do list, set down the tasks and have a little audience with that moon in intentional stillness. You don't have to do anything. The blindfold isn't there to throw you off. It's there to deprive your senses so you can really drop into the moment. Because there's something being offered here. It's like a lighthouse. There's a gentle, guiding, warm light and a cup that's being offered. A bit of medicinal, emotional healing might occur. Maybe it's forgiveness. Maybe it's forgiveness for yourself. That'd be really nice. It's on the way, and you deserve it. That's your reading, Virgo. <laughs> I'm super stoked that I hung on to this print. <clears throat> I've never made a lino cut print ever again because I was shit at it. I'm too, I'm too messy for that kind of precision. I'm not a craftsperson. I'm like very expressive in my creation um, but I am glad that I hung on to it because I tell you she's been guiding me through with these messages today and there's been a lot of forgiveness that I've been able to provide for myself and for others too and I'm not a monster Maybe I was behaving like one for a while, but not anymore. If you're still here with me, drop me a snake in the comments, please. Um, you don't have to write anything, but I'm just trying to get the algorithm to like me, to get more eyes on this work. Um, so if you're still here and you like what I've said, drop me a snake. Um, also, you can join me at the ritual on Sunday. So it's this weekend, Sunday the 4th. Um, it's 50 bucks, but also the discount code six of pentacles will knock 25% off. So it's going to be a two hour ritual of again, storytelling on zoom. I'll be in, engaging in a full moon ritual to work with the energy of Sagittarius and of Athena and also, um, doing a little bit of a group collective spread too. And I'll be able to answer any questions you have about your chart and the moon in there as well. Um, but yeah. I'll speak to you in two weeks for the new moon in Gemini. Take care, Virgo. Love you. Bye.